that quick access. Yeah, Crafty has, you know, honestly, what the F do companies keep making RPG or reference ma manuals with glossy pages? Flat pages are better for reading and referencing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Matt, it, Matt it, type it, pages, much, much better. Coriolis and Alien have black pages with white text. Again, this is, uh, this is a stylistic choice. Great for PDFs, bad for actual physical copies. These people have to learn that. Have to learn that. Now, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen for a second so I can go to... I want to talk to you about problems I had with the system. The system itself. Okay, so the the d20 system we are going to talk about just a little bit in case anyone is not familiar tell us how these this uh 2d20 system works is that a command to me yes okay so for any given role you've got your kind of your uh skill and then you are separate into two categories where it's like reason um <clears throat> presence control fitness that type of stuff okay so hang on Let, let's let's even break down even further you're talking about an attribute plus a learned skill yeah together equals what it equals your target number which you have to roll for in order to succeed you have to roll under or equal to okay so that is your threshold for success and you roll yeah. two two d20s so you can yeah. possibly get two successes normally i mean there there, there are situations where you roll less and more D20, yeah. obviously, but that's the basic 2D20 system. Okay, yep. so, you know, uh, mo most most times you only require one success to succeed at a task. If a task is especially difficult or it or it's a task over time, then you will, you will need uh, to make more than one success over maybe even over successive rounds to, yeah. to finish a task. A, okay, great. Um, a DM can also um, even raise that more and force players like, okay, this is basically impossible. To do this, you need three or four successes, in which case you need to get additional dice, either from people assisting you or other mechanics, in order to uh, get that roll. I haven't seen that so much uh, once or twice, but it is an option where you DM could basically say, uh, if you want to go for this, shoot, but you're going to have to basically roll like a genie. Okay. Now an, another thing that is special about I don't know if it's special about this with with a D with a two D twenty systems uh, Crafty can tell me if this is in Conan as well but uh, the idea of momentum if you get more successes than is required to perform a task you get a you get a a token or a point of momentum that can be shared with your entire group and if your group needs to make some kind of exceptional or or an automatic success with with a role that's very difficult they can take that momentum token or point away from the pool to give themselves an extra d20 to roll on their next task which i thought was an interesting mechanic because it carries over scene to scene but the the, uh, the 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 pool, I believe, is supposed to decrease by one if you leave a scene. Yeah, so we uh, we haven't played by that rule. Basically, we handle it episode by episode because we're like we got a big group, so we're switching between scenes all the time. Okay. Like, and usually it's sort of like a smooth transition if we're going from one place to another. So mm -hmm. we don't have our, our the way our DM uh, sets it up. It's it doesn't l lend itself well to that rule. So we <laughs> homebrew and like yeah, it's it's we just have a pool to keep track of over the course of the full episode um but yeah it, it's i like this mechanic so you can go on but we can discuss how it works in practice okay okay yeah yeah uh, uh how it works in practice uh what is the uh the the one problem that 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 i that i foresaw with this i didn't gripe about it too much but because it could be a problem, but I didn't know because I hadn't played. So I'm going to ask you because you have played. Can the momentum pool get too big? No, it's capped at five. It's capped at five. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. So, and that worked because you, at a certain point, you're going to start using it. 
because it's like, well, we're just going to get momentum burn off. But then at the same time, you're also having to think about what does my DM have in mind for the next task that we need to perform? So it actually works out to be, this is probably the most engaging mechanic when it comes to a player in just how to balance out strategically what you're doing besides like the overall narrative, but just in the mechanics itself, you're always looking at, if you get a great role, it's like, hey, we got some momentum. And then it's like, okay, we got a bad situation. We can either try to get an advance on it or use a momentum, uh, it costs two to re-roll a dice. Mm-hmm. So it comes up as your sort of your moment to moment resource that you're spending the most time sort of focusing on as a player in terms of what you have equipped because your equipment, all that type of stuff, your inventory doesn't really change that much unless you're in a much more sort of engaging scenario. Like for us, we don't really do too much with that. It's more of less a narrative thing. But I mean, the momentum mechanic, I think, is probably out of combined with how the 2D, uh, yeah, how the skills and attributes work for the 2D20 system. And this, I think this is probably the highlight of uh, playing this game versus others because it does build in mechanically that that sense of investment, payoff, risk, return, that type of stuff. Okay, uh, Indigo Dragon says the momentum in the book apparently is captured. Ah, I'm going to get my after my DM for that because we've okay. been using five. And uh, Crafty says uh, momentum and threat slash doom, which we're going to get to threat in a second, is hugely important in in, in uh, Conan. So it is it is uh, per- pervasive in other 2D20 systems as well, which is good to know. Good to know. Now, the whole threat thing, um, this is the Game Master's version of momentum. All right. Now, the 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 uh, the game master gains threat by uh, one of one of the ways is uh, players can buy a point of momentum by giving the game master a point of threat. Mm-hmm. Now, how how other how other ways can uh, has your game master gotten threat? Uh, they start out with a certain um, uh, certain pool based on the number of players, and because we're a large group. He's got a lot of threat to play with. So okay. it, he's usually using what he's got at the start of the episode and then you, uh, me, uh, measuring that out over the course of things. We haven't, we have spent a little bit of threat for some momentum uh, uh, in a few situations, but that's typically how we're running is just sort of the base level of threat um, okay. for a situation. Okay. So he starts off, uh, your, your game master starts off with a threat, like what one threat per player or I think it's one or two threat per people playing. And then, yeah, it's something like that. I think it's two threat per player. So he ends up with like, since it's like five or six players, uh, in a game, he ends up with like like 10 or 12, right? Yeah. So it's, so he is perfectly fine because he's going to, he's really strategic with how he throws in threat. So he'll like use it when he really wants to make it hurt. And he'll pile it on for a given situation. So he's going to spend like four or five threat at once rather than just like metering out one or two here because that doesn't really do a whole lot because you're only moving the uh, target or the complication range a little bit. But he he has a tendency of just piling in the threat and then it creates a really dramatic moment. Okay, yeah, that and that's exactly what, what threat is for. And that's great. Now, I'm going to circle back to this a little later this whole like spending four or five threat at once that 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 should make a very dangerous Ooh, situation yeah it should make a very dangerous situation but in your experience playing this year and those over a year how many times has any of your characters been in a situation where they could have died uh I think three. One right now in our current game. Actually, no. In our current game, everyone could potentially die because our ship is going to have its ass handed to itself. Um, so we're sort of we're ramping up uh, up right there. But we've been in a situation where, and it's through really big, not like you know, over the course of a scenario, you're losing health and then you're at a certain point. But it's usually a big dramatic moment where it's like, yeah, this person just got assimilated by the Borg. Good luck getting him back. It's that type of scenario where we fully expected one of these characters to die. And then we just pulled a rabbit out of our hat with the rolls and like, oh, nope, he's good. Okay. So, so uh, how, how, how many times has, has, has anyone in your game actually taken damage? Uh, I think uh, 
two or three, but that's kind of that's on us for our focus. So this is going to be the most variable component because your DM can be a lot more active. We do a lot of exploration and sort of investigation and kind of like <laughs> what you would almost say truck should be. We're, we're trying to figure things out. We're working with people. So a lot of our uh, situations are sort of at the edge of combat where if it goes a certain way, we will get into a fight, but you, we're usually good at finding a way around that. But then other DMs are going to be able to say, okay, no, you're just in a firefight with the Klingons right now. Good luck. And then if you get into that situation, you're probably going to take some damage. But it's just for our style of gameplay drama and just how we like to roll with stuff. We're usually not, we usually try to find a side path around that as mm -hmm. a group. And that's what you have when you have a bunch of scientist characters on a ship and no one really doing the strong tactical role where we don't have the wharf saying, I will just shoot this thing. I was thinking about playing that role, but then they, they shanghaied me into being the captain. Okay. Oh, and that, that's, that's another question I want to ask you. That's another problem I thought of uh, when I was, when I was uh, role playing the game. Uh, the game allows one of the players to be the captain of the ship. And I foresaw problems with this yeah, because so I don't know a lot of groups who will, un unless they universally vote this person to be the captain to, to follow the, the Star Trek lore, which even, you know, barring, barring, uh, the, 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 the Equinox in, uh, Ooh. Voyager uh, is pretty strict. Even even on Enterprise, which was the loosest of them, yeah, no one no one was going to tell the captain he was full of shit on the bridge. No one was yeah. going to do that. Okay, so if the captain gave an order, you followed it. If you didn't follow it, get the get out. You're in the brig. Yeah. You know? so, so how how did that work with you being the captain? How does that change the dynamic with you and the group? So what you need for this type of situation is someone who is naturally like the ringleader. So for a lot of the stuff, I'm kind of taking on a producer role with trying to get people to schedule. Uh, if there's a guest coming on, I'm usually the person to sort of directly interface with them. So, mm -hmm. and that, this kind of carries on from a little bit of Foundry Roundtable where I just sort of take that natural organizational role and I'm not like putting my own like, I, like I'm not treating this as like, if I was a tactical officer, like we should do this. I'm naturally like listening to players, what's the best option? And then I make a decision and then we go based on that decision. So it actually works as a healthy crew dynamic um, in a lot of these situations because I'm like, I do have that ultimate say, but I'm also listening through people around me and trying to find the legitimately best idea possible. There are disagreements and I had to put someone like, no, we are not going to basically ram an Orion uh, war barge by getting into their warp field and hoping that we can outslug them at point blank. I actually had to say, no, we're not going to do that. And it disappointed that player a little bit, but it's like we, for all of that going on, we also have a lot more collaboration and cooperation. So you need the right player in this role. If you do not have this uh, player in your group, you will need to, the DM needs to take on the captain role because okay. this could go bad, but if you have a natural, like a group dynamic can naturally lend to this situation playing out, but you need to still have someone that's not going to just like use orders just to get their own way. And that's, you just need, you need some, like that captain, you have to be really careful with who you put into that because, and this kind of goes with a natural captain role, because if you screw that up, you're going to get a bad, a bad dynamic. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what I was worried about. Um, you, you, you got around that just, just by having the right group. Yeah. But if you have the wrong group, then, then having someone be the captain is a horrible idea. Yeah. So you need to really, if you're setting this up, you need to really think about your crew roles. And then mm -hmm. take that captain decision, sort of like what you do last. So you have all your ducks in a row. You've got all your characters. And then it's like, okay, what are the dynamics? Who's first officer, second officer? And we've had a little bit of, uh, like, we, a little bit of uncertainty of, like, the, the chain of command, I think, is probably what's a little bit in. I don't know if this is in the group, uh, but, like, in the book. But we've kind of handled it. Like, we've got a second officer, third officer, fourth officer. And we kind of have a little bit of a hierarchy there. That I think can introduce more problems because then you start getting into these differentials, like especially with like rank, like a commander and a lieutenant character. I think that is a little bit more problematic. So it's kind of like you also want your like the rest of your players to the same rank. So you don't have people like taking a differential and just like 
automatically think they can gain say someone else. Well, there there is uh, a lot of precedent for uh, uh, people of lower rank but higher position mm-hmm. in a situation to 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 have to have command over yeah. over the, someone who, like for for example, um, if there is a uh, an ensign who is a bridge officer mm-hmm. and a lieutenant who is not, and the lieutenant is on the bridge. The ensign has command. The ensign mm-hmm. is the bridge officer. Yeah. So, so it, you know, in situations like that, there's already uh, based on 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 TNG at the very least, where uh, it you know a lower ranking officer, mm-hmm. depending o- upon their 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 duty role, mm-hmm. will have command over a higher ranking officer. Yeah, it's the player to player command when you're dealing with a larger group. Because I think that could be more complicated to try to work out. Because now you got a big network rather than just a central figure, and then just everyone else is sort of working around that. So now it's that I think for me personally, it's been a little bit harder to sort of wrangle around because you're having to think about all these uh, like all these different dynamics. Like, okay, do I outrank this person? Do I outrank this person? If we're having a discussion, how much deference does my character need to put in this situation based on their role, based on like th- the entire structure there rather than just like, hey, we're just crew members. We're going to work through this, you know, one person to another. We get in a lot of scenes. So it's like one of those things where you have to have that careful balance of like how far you take this sort of that programmatic chain of command versus the captain crew dynamic. Mm-hmm. So because it's just more complicated, especially if you're trying to work this in a game setting, you're doing this like once a month, once every two weeks, something like that. And you just want to get onto the fun of it. I'd think getting caught up on those ranks, if you have players that do that, is kind of like you just want them to stop. <laughs> get on with the fun. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So uh, an- another thing that I'm having trouble. Oh, there we go. Um. Dying in this game is hard. Mm-hmm. All right. Here, uh, here's an example. I, I tried to find the slide where where I'm talking about actually how to die. Uh, Crafty yeah. was, was saying earlier, you want to die. He, I'm going to put on the screen. Uh, uh, you want to take damage. Playing his uh, Conan two two D twenty game, they die a lot in Star Trek Adventures. I don't know how it is in Conan. We will find out because. Because Crafty's going to talk about Conan on on the show later on this month, but uh, dying in in Star Trek Adventures is difficult. Here here is for what I understand. Here are the steps that have to be taken. You have a certain amount of stress. This this is you're basically your hit points or your yeah. health. They call it stress. Fine, call it whatever you want. It is uh, an it is attribute plus skill. It is at is your your attribute is what fortitude? Yeah, or it's fitness. Fitness and then your security. Yeah, yeah, your security skill. Add those together. That is how much stress you can take before you take an automatic injury. Now there is caveats. If you take five or more stress in a single attack, you get an injury. If you are brought down to zero stress, you get an injury. Once you have an injury, if you get another injury, this is a life-threatening injury. If you take another injury, then you're dead. Yeah. So you literally need to take three injuries before you die. And tell me if I'm wrong here. Anyone can spend an action, go to somebody who's had an injury and say, hey, are you okay? Yeah, we haven't gotten to that point, but yeah, like you can have, you've got other people around you yeah. who can interfere, like you do first aid medicine, take care of stuff like that, stabilize you. So it is really hard to go, like with the natural mechanics, to die. I think it's easier to die through the course of narrative causality. Like your character is on an exploding ship and you decided to leave, like stay behind. That I think is where a character is more likely to go. It's just they get into a situation where ship explodes. Okay, you take a billion damage. <laughs> Yeah, something yeah, like you're that. just gonna die. Yeah, you're just you're just gonna die from that. So, that's that's catastrophic damage. Yeah, yeah. So, but I'm, I'm I'm just talking about normal, you know, hand to hand, excuse me, phaser combat, disruptor combat, stuff like that. That's yeah. pretty much how it goes. Yeah, and this seems like it's 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 trying to like because 
like the whole Star Trek thing is like you're playing a character, you're going to get emotionally invested in that character a little bit more than a lot of other games. Like mm -hmm. when we're doing the Call of Cthulhu game, it's like I'm going to throw myself out of the car and explode. I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah, you're good. Um, it's a different but, mindset. Yeah, it's a different mindset. But you're you're especially if like playing it over a year, like a GM is basically not going to put you in a position to die if. Like if you're got if you're got a you know that a life threatening injury, they're not going to come out and it's like oh stab, just take you out because that's just a jerk move. Well, no, like, I mean, it, it, I I would give players a chance to save you, but if they oh, yeah. elected not to or if they failed to, then that's what happens. You know, yeah. I mean, so it's it just like, comes down to the dice at some point. You know, yeah. It, and, it, it, if if it doesn't come down to the dice, you're not role playing. You're storytelling. Yeah, so that's kind of the thing where it's like it comes down to the dice. It, it, like there's a tenuous connection that allows players to die as a result of the dice. I think they're trying to make it as weak as possible to emphasize the story or the role playing, the storytelling. I think that is what the system is trying to go for. Okay, with so this overly complicated mechanic is just to try to find that balance, and they just put so many checkpoints along the way. So it technically exists that you can die as a result of dice rolls. Like if you fail bad enough, that can happen. But it's it's basically something that sort of exists, and you're pro like if that situation arises, you're probably having to go to the book or PDF to look up these mechanics because you just haven't used them like throughout the rest of the game. So yeah, it's see, uh, from from what I understand from uh, from from reading, I wish I could find it in the book, and I wish I could find it in the slide. But you literally. By, by if I remember correctly, by reading the book, if you take a million damage, you still can't die. Yeah, that's where you start doing the home rule, home bruise thing of just like yeah, er, because the the rule is if you take five plus damage, you take an injury. an injury. If you are reduced to zero, you take an injury. So if you took a million damage, that's two injuries. You yeah, will you now have a hurt. lethal injury, and so, if you take another injury then you will die. But this was one attack. You yeah. cannot get two injuries oh, from one attack. So the way this, would, if you wanted to sort of rules lawyer it, the ship explodes, you take the explosion damage and now you're in the vacuum of space and then you, and take, then you take another one and then you die. Yes, that's how yeah. you do it. But if, uh, if, if you get, if you get stabbed in the heart, like, like, uh, like a young Picard, yeah, you're just you, you're you at, took at, an injury from five plus damage, then you were reduced to zero stress. You took another injury. You now have a life threatening injury. As long as someone is there to go, hey, hey, Picard, are you okay? You're gonna live. Yeah, it's it's that situation where you can't get one shotted out of something unless you already have an injury from something yeah. else. Yes. But even exactly. that, it's really hard to get an injury. We've taken a few points of stress damage through just basic combat, but especially with the D, uh, the 2D20 system on top of combat and what you can do as characters in this world, it's that situation of you're going through this and there's so many things that you can do to sort of sidestep like taking damage that you can avoid a lot of that. But that also depends on the GM. Right. So if you got a GM who really wants you to fight those uh, Klingons, you are ultimately going to fight those Klingons and go through this combat system. So it's one of those things where you can engage with it, but we found the most fun is really focusing more on this as sort of a soft uh, role play system. Okay, so right. we are going to segue into the damage system in a second, but Indigo Dragon has some help for you. On page 84 of the book, you can point to your GM that the you know uh, uh, if he argues the maximum pool being five, you can show him that it's actually six. I think we may have used like six at the start. It's just like we've been doing five recently, and I think we've also been getting the um the like when you get momentum wrong because it's just been we've been playing a year. It's been so long since we actually went to the book, except we're trying to look up damage types like from certain weapons on certain ships and like focusing on ship combat and going to that. But yeah, it's sort of the basic stuff we can uh, tune up okay. a little bit. So that, that brings up uh, another problem with the system that I had. And we're going to add it to the stream right now. This is the damage uh, used in in this system. And Crafty, he's not here anymore, but I, I, he will tell us if it's the same in uh, in Conan as well. But um, you use your, your, your 2d20 to succeed or fail to attack someone. And then your weapon has a base damage. Mm -hmm. number of dice for example a type one phaser has damage of six that's six dice of damage you roll 
66. Yeah. And then you you and then you look at this challenge dice result table. Now Mo, Modifius sells specialized dice to give you one two zero or one plus effect. I hate specialized dice. I hate them. They're stupid. There's plenty of dice in the world already, asshole. <laughs> Just make your system to use some of them. Okay, subscribe. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> Subscribe. All right, but this one it, it gives you it gives you the uh, the thing. So let let's say I roll a two two three three two two three three four five. Okay, so I got uh two two two. So that's four three three. That's zero. A four and a five. That's uh, five plus an effect. Now that's five damage that I've done, right? To this person, five yeah. damage plus whatever effect, special effect my weapon has. And for a phaser, I forget what the special effect is. Uh, for for a disruptor, I believe it it uh, it de it defeats armor. Yeah. Um, for a, a a plasma weapon, it causes some kind of dot or something. I'm not sure. I forget. It's yeah. been two years since I read it, but uh, your your weapon, be it uh, phaser, disruptor, plasma, uh, knife, batleth, sword, will have some kind of special effect. And if you roll a five or a six, you get to enact this special effect on top of your damage. Now, I thought this was clunky. I thought I thought that uh, that the special dice thing is stupid. Now you've been in combat before, obviously yeah. not, not dangerous combat because you haven't taken much stress or injuries at all, or yeah. well, none of your characters have been here death. So when you have been in combat, how has this mechanic been used? So it's basically, as you say, we do the, uh, the D sixes, get the effect, all that type of stuff. The effects haven't really come in too much just because I mean, usually it's like, Hey, we killed it. <laughs> um, but for how the system works, it's I think it's the least satisfying because you get like you do the like you do the role for doing the attack. And then it's like, OK, you succeeded in that that now here is what you have going for the effect that did. So you can get a huge, you know, big success. Hey, I punched the guy in the face and then it's like, OK. Now we have to deal with like these dice, and I've never really liked this part of the system. I think there's probably a much more elegant way of handling it and to connecting it because it seems like at this stage it's just another luck element to on top of the luck element that you just had for whether or not your thing worked. And this is probably why we don't do that much combat is because we don't have faith that we will actually get through it because there's just so many of these like multiple rounds of probability going on. We have the probability. Well, now, to be fair. To be fair, I mean, in a lot of role-playing games, there is the dice roll element to hit and then the yeah. dice roll element for the variable amount of damage. Now, it's, from where my experience in playing D&D, though, it's like if I'm a wizard and I, I feel confident in doing my wizard stuff. In Star Trek Adventures, I don't feel confident. It is entirely time. possible to do zero damage with an awesome hit. Yeah, and that's where I think it, there needs to... like This like affects there just needs to be another way of working this out because I don't like the two, the, the 2d20 system. I like this mechanic. I don't really like, because there's just so many dice you can really like, it's like hit with a damn squib. And yeah, I, I, I want a different way or even just different types of dice, different mechanics for this. Even if it's another dice roll, maybe there's like a minimum threshold that you've hit. And then this is like the effect, like the special effect. Like you get a certain amount of base damage for what you did in the initial roll, then here's y'all your basically your pinata time. Something right. like that would work out better because as it is, like I don't get into combat because I don't have that confidence as a character for for my sheet. And even doing something I'm competent at in combat, mm -hmm. of this working out where it's like, no, I'm gonna try to you know, and that's it gets into my character style, but because yeah, we can get into that a little bit later. But I'm usually trying to find a way around situations like this. And it, I think it extends to how this mechanic okay, works. Okay, so you actually actively avoid combat because you and your group do not like this challenge dice system. 
It's yeah, it's like we don't have the confidence to do it, and we don't have characters that are really min-maxed, like to really have the upper hand. We don't have someone who went pure ta- like I'm gonna kick everyone's butt security. Okay, I okay, hang on, hang on. Of- we are gonna circle back to that. Yeah, we, we are we are gonna circle back to that, but first I want to I want to ask you. Um another problem that I I that that I foresaw with the game. Mm-hmm. And if anyone wants to wants to uh, cite this, you can you can uh, look on YouTube, type in Legion of Myth, Star Trek Adventures, and you'll 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 hear me say this. The only way to learn this system is not to read the book. Mm-hmm. It's to learn it from someone who already knows it. Yeah, now, that was my thought two years ago. And Duncan told me how his game is run, and I laughed out loud. Because Duncan, it is exactly that. How many game masters do you have? We have a DM who's in charge of the story, the flow, the sort of the ultimate decisions for that. And then we've got someone who's handling the rules. So we've so and it, it kind of like it works because we got a great storyteller for our DM. Sure. And then we've got someone who's great with the mechanics, but would be less good at running the full narrative. And they've basically teamed up and sort of employed their skills to best effect. So it okay. runs really smoothly, but we I'm did sure have to learn it. I'm sure it does run really smoothly with, with double the game masters. But uh, the problem is, it seems like because you need an extra games master just for the end. That 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 was for you, Grim. If you're watching yeah. Games Master, uh, if if you need an, an an extra Games Master just for the rules, that means teaching the rules to the players is difficult. Yeah, and that's where you really it almost comes down to you, that extra or that person who's the most familiar, like basically the person that you get on board who already knows mechanics and can teach everyone, is also doing a lot of the dis- like like he's doing the like the bund of most of the work in setting everything up. Mm-hmm. So looking at your stats, looking at your role, although our, our DM does like he he's good at like the, the challenge stuff. It's or the the basic roles we've got down. It's whenever we get into combat, that's where we typically have our uh other players the rules GM, the rules GM uh come in and sort of f- figure everything out because it's like okay we're attacking that ship with a phaser what type of armor does it have? What type of ship does it have? Is it cat like what's it's effectively it's tier versus us and that's where i mean those situations work but we're not using most of the mechanics when it comes to, like spaceship combat because that's just another level of like okay so uh um in in lieu of of everyone learning the mechanics which you can't in my opinion from the book no. officially and in lieu of the person who does know which is the this uh, second game master uh teaching everyone I so think they, so hang on hang on not so 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 they they can participate themselves he's actually handling all of that behind the scenes based on the decisions you make he's he's making all the roles he's he's doing all the math and he's yeah. giving you a result well we're he tells us basically what to roll and then we roll it and usually we're pretty on board with most of this sort of the day-to-day stuff mm-hmm. but it's we don't understand the rules intimately enough to be able to handle the sort of the special case scenarios i think that's where we're at we're also kind of at the beginner level of understanding the mechanics You've been playing a year you should not be at the beginner level playing of well, understanding yeah, this because game at any point yeah, yeah because what we do is basically like and we just have this sort of this realm where we're like we don't like getting into that level of really deep mechanics and that's where it's just the natural lean of the group there's like three of us who could really get into that type of thing but then some of the other players are a little bit are more into the storytelling aspect and the way we've kind of run out or found our equilibrium is having this uh just an rpg light style for how this works out and we can handle the day-to-day stuff like i can i know my roles but then it's like okay i'm attacking with a phaser i need help setting that up okay and i think All that's right. where you can that yeah, yeah. that I, I have a problem with that I, but me me personally uh if i were a player in that game i would want to know all of the mechanics be intimately familiar with all yeah. the mechanics so uh, be, because if i'm not i don't feel i could make an informed decision on what yeah. to do next so it's kind of that thing where i think it's like the presentation of this versus 
other types of RPGs where Call of Cthulhu, I had a really good handle like on game one. If I was going to attack someone, how does that work? Yeah. And that information is kind of there with the Star Trek RPG, but it's pretty obscure. Yeah. I think it's hard to with- find. Like I said, the index, not a help. Yeah, and it's also just like even getting a handle of like what are the comp- consequences of this action, it's just naturally vague. And I think there's, it's one of those things where if you have players like that, I think we just don't have anyone that has that mentality of I need to understand everything before I do it. Because what we generally do is kind of like, this is interesting or fun. We're going to see if we can get it to work and then it either succeeds or fails. So we have okay. a little bit more now, of a... Go, go, doing doing that to me lends to uh, things happening that are disastrous. Like a, like a Tasha Yar situation, a Jadzia Dax situation, or a uh, Commander Tucker situation, where... Uh, you, you, you don't un- understand what's, you don't fully understand the mechanics of everything that's happening. And then you could just die. Tasha so, Yar did, did not, uh, did not understand that this, that this tar beast could do one attack and do a billion damage. And then she just died. And then, uh, um, Jadzia Dax did not understand that a pa wraith hitting her one time would just murder her. And so of course that. But, Commander Tucker understood that flooding an entire deck's electrical energy through his body would kill him. Now he did it anyway. Fuck him. Yeah. All right. Whatever. You know, like stuff like that. So if, if, the thing if, is, if you don't understand the mechanics of the game, you can't stop stuff like that from happening. But the thing is, you can see those events happening narratively. So you can understand like, oh, I've got nothing. This is Max Lea, by the way. This isn't me. Oh. This is Max Lea. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically that's the thing too. I would recommend it as it's basically it's an RPG light session for people who want to get into the creativity and roleplay. It is really not good for the hardcore mechanics. I'd recommend anything else basically if you really want to get into that because okay. it's difficult to appreciate it. And you kind of get the sense if you're watching some of the more serious RPG channels when they take an action, it does take them like a little while to work through all of the stuff that can apply, and usually it's coming to a grinding halt. Star Trek Adventures can be hella fun. It's basically a hangout bullshitting in a creative like writing sense. And there's certain aspects for me where I get a real kick out of that. Mm-hmm. But it's it doesn't give me the same sense of the mechanics like we're doing Call of Cthulhu, like I've had with D&D, of right. we're, like, getting into that aspect, the sort of the game aspect of it. And it's really, I think geared towards that storytelling aspect with how all complex like these well hang on hang on no no you from what i have gathered from you talking your group has homebrewed this game to be more storyteller aspect than it than it's written so to a limited extent yes but it's usually because we're the biggest thing we're doing is just sort of naturally working through these um like basically the scenes we're using the d20 system more than the d6 system so that's the biggest thing we do that sort of departs from how you're supposed to work through this with oh i don't think there's many exceptions where we've really just said no that's just we're not going to focus on that rule it just like a lot of this stuff just doesn't come up ever and that's because like we think first to do second and we're usually like oh yeah we can totally pierce the uh we can totally do an amazing scan find cloak ships pierce their cloak, beam their commanders off, and then basically, hey, now we got to negotiate. Instead of okay. like getting into All combat. Right. So, so you actually actively avoid combat as as fun or to stay away from combat? It's usually how, how for, much how much is that weighing on you? Yeah, so it's usually like it's that it's the concept of fun, but it's like because the mechanic like the combat mechanics are obtuse, they're not fun. It's more okay. fun all where right. you're going through like a rapid pace, like action, 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 action thing that happens. You might get into a little bit of combat, like a little bit, but usually it's like, I'm going to, uh, no, we'd actually, no, I think the last time we're going to get into combat this episode, but the last time we did it, um, we replicated the episode naked now where the entire crew gets drunk. Yeah. And I bum rushed my uh, uh, chief engineer and the entire engineering team after opening fire after they were like having a birthday party in main engineering with like phasers on stun. So we got into the mechanics there, but usually it was like the fun part was the D20 system. 
And then it's like D6 system. Okay, yeah, I said through it, go through it. Okay, now we're back to fun. Okay, all right. So you you are at least most people are subconsciously avoiding combat just because they don't like the mechanic. I would say that consciously, part of it. consciously, they're 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 saying that it's more fun avoiding combat be because it's more thrilling. It's more uh uh in uh, yeah. it's, it's more pat on your back ingenuity type type thing. Yeah, it's and that's I think the way it works is even when you get into combat, usually it's it's pretty equal because we don't have anyone that's super built for combat. Where and we don't have a ship, we don't have a warship, so it's not like we really have that much confidence in what we do. And our our okay. our DM when we're getting into these combat situations is always giving us support chips. So he's got the flexibility to still work to the end point of the scene within the limits of what we're doing. So he can play around with that but he's got to engineer those scenarios because again we don't have that flexibility in where we want to go with an episode versus it, like when we're going through a you know basically a set path with where he's uh taking us through or it's like if the ship blows up hey that's a kind of a problem for <laughs> the evening unless yeah, we want to yeah. do a time travel now, like an immediate uh, time travel episode uh and now 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 i'm now's the time where i'm spinning back to uh to uh, uh, you don't have any battle focused characters. You don't have any characters who are who yeah. are min maxed for battle, so you don't feel confident in the whole yeah. battle thing. Now I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show you the screen again. This is the character I made using the life path system. Yeah. Okay. And now now uh, now uh, to be fair, D Duncan said he made his character through the the online choice system. He didn't mm -hmm. do any random rolls. He. He went. He went through the. He, he went through the life path options and chose which options to take. Yeah. I random rolled everything, and according to him, my character is well rounded, but is is pretty well suited for command and for combat. Yeah, so you're pretty close to where I ended up with your skill points. I did actually a little bit more min-maxing, but away from security stuff and more towards command stuff. Because I realized my character was not going to be in that like direct punch-up type uh, situation. Like I'd be basically like Picard through the TNG series, not the TNG movies. You've got a great Riker here. Yeah. So that's what we've come to on yes. that point. So, which is which is why I chose Commander. Yeah. So I think this is where it kind of comes in with the the group of players is that we all did the choice system and we all ended up doing more science and engineering, con and medicine, and then a bit of command. No one's a really great fighter, and that's because we all well, like make our characters. We didn't have that player besides me, and I got put into the command position, who would take that role. So our like our chief tactical officer and security officer are NPCs. So our okay, DM so has had to supplement that. I, I I actually find that find that weird that uh, in in a group no one wanted to take the fighter role. You know. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like it because I, I think we're strange. and it's just the way our group works is that we're all sort of more science engineering like with how we sort of latch on. I'm more tactical, and again I got put into situation uh put away from that, and then our um. Oh, no, we do have someone that's good for combat, but space combat, because they're a really great con officer, but on the ground, they have a tendency of tripping over their own phaser, or at least attempting to. All right, got it. So, yeah, it's for the Worf or Tasha Yar type character, that's what we don't really have. So we don't mm -hmm. have that voice in the group pushing us in that direction, besides what our GM does, because they've filled in those roles with NPCs, so we can actually have away missions. Okay. Without... <laughs> and, and and not die be because you're all geeks and and nerds and squints so yeah, you know you're, you're, you know a, a, a group yeah. of klingons will just you know disembowel you for just yeah. cut and i think it's also with where we're coming from in this we're all you know star trek online players it's a combat heavy game and what we're looking for is the stuff that sto doesn't do and that we used to get out of the foundry and now it's like okay we're doing more of that like fun bottle episode type stuff Rather than like, we've got to take this facility from the Klingons, rush in, stuff like that. It's just like, yeah, that's usually where we're not having the most fun. We had 
I mean, well, so far, now, now, is this because of the kind of playing you want to do, or is this because of the the inherent dislike that many of you have for the damage system? I think it's both. It's a, okay. and that's where I think the game works well for us, and right. where we've kept going for a year on it. Yeah, it's because we found a game that sort of suits our natural inclinations, where its stumbling points don't come up for us. And I think that's kind of the thing to recommend for SDA is just. If you have that group, you have those players, this can fill a niche, but it's going to be a niche thing. You mm -hmm. need to have a group that's really into Star Trek, that wants to take it out for creative writing. And basically, what you need are foundry authors to really make this work. You need a group of foundry authors who are basically communal storytelling in the moment and using the mechanics to just sort of work through minor actions. Okay. All right. Think, All right. All right. We, we're going to have to stop it here Yeah. for this, uh, for this segment. But... Uh, uh, I'm going to sum up the the problems with the book, how it's written, how it's typeset, and all that stuff. We both agree. Yeah, that's that's an issue. The index worthless. The 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 the, the narrative explanation of facts bad yeah. call, especially a game like this. Especially the game like just bad call. Uh, having a having a book with black pages white text and a pdf with white pages black text should have been reversed yeah yeah okay so uh to play this game and enjoy it you had to homebrew the damage system basically away yeah and that's kind of the way to think that's yeah i'd say that is like i think that's fair we're not like changing the mechanics, but we're avoiding the mechanics. You're avoid. You're actively, you're actively avoiding the mechanic because you don't like it. Yeah. And 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 you yeah and and you you did tell me there was a fight where you were the game master at one point where there was a fight where you oh yeah you actively did not use the damage no. system. You just gave out damage. Yeah, because all I did was like we like I was just trying to get through the night, and I'm like I really don't have time for this. I'm just gonna have them roll like just their d20, and I was like, okay, you got more success than him, you knock him out. All right, because so that that reinforces that the, is, the idea oh, from this. The idea I I I gave out from this book that from reading this book, you can't learn the system well mm -hmm. enough to be comfortable. You can't. Yeah, and then that's you also good... why you have two game masters. <laughs> yeah, or I mean, it's. I would also say it's down to the personality. We could theoretically have one, and there's one person in our group that could have that role if they wanted to do their own session. But we've got basically a very story side, someone who's extreme story side, and then someone who's extreme mechanic side, and it's just like yeah, they just work together on it. So okay, yeah, but I would say that works better than one person trying to like handle okay. it all. Okay, so. Uh, take with that what you will. Um, mm -hmm. I think that many, many of my, my points are, are confirmed. Yeah. Um, it's... one, 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 one thing that, uh, that, that I will, I will give is that, uh, um, I didn't think to, to homebrew the damage out. I mean, that we, we did have a comment earlier that, uh, let me, let me, let me see if I could find it. Um, where, all D20 games have damage, have damage dice like this. They have the, yeah. the uh, challenge dice that work like this, except Dishonored. Dishonored got rid of them for flat damage instead. And that's exactly what you did In that when, when you game yeah. mastered. You got rid of it and used flat damage. So there are D or there are two D20 games that do this. And and uh uh Indigo Dragon also believes that the uh the Dune RPG that's coming yes. out won't have these damage dice either they will also Ooh. have a flat damage system he I'm believes totally that he doesn't know obviously because we don't know yeah but, so uh, i'm gonna look into that because the dune rpg is what i want like if i do more dming that's the one i want to run that's the one you want to do okay so hopefully it will it, it, uh, you but you can homebrew it to just do flat damage you know like phaser yeah. damage is six just say it does six yeah, stuff you like know? that I if think you that's... don't have armor and you get hit with a phaser set to kill guess what you die you know, yeah, and that's that, what happens. Or yeah. now, no, no, by the rules, it does six damage. That means you have a lethal injury. It takes the multiple stages to get down there. And yes, yeah, it takes think, a lethal. You, you now have a lethal injury because you've taken five plus damage in one hit. And uh, you're and you, you, you may be brought down to zero stress. So you have at least an injury. 
-hmm. at least an injury. This is a great but game. For you could also have a lethal injury if you're brought down to zero stress. So yeah, okay. You uh you you homebrew out the damage system yeah. for the most part to to make it work better for you. Yeah, and either okay. because I'm just saying that happens or the GM says that happens or we just avoid it. And I think, okay. again, a flat damage system on SDA would work a lot better. Okay. And and the reason he suspects that is because the Dune dice packs only come with two D20s and no challenge dice. Yes. So so there, there, there's no special Modifius dice to be bought for the yeah. game, which, which infers... Or no, no, no. It implies that uh, that there is no uh, damage dice system like the one yeah. in in Star Trek Adventures. Okay, and, so and it's Mordifius right. making the Dune RPG, right? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, and they could be them just refining, like basically taking feedback from this and then refining it, like the Klingon core rule, but not using black and white. Yeah, yeah. That was that was a that was a good call. That was uh, that was an yeah, excellent. So call. they're learning, but you kind of see the evolution here, right? Okay, so uh, that is it. I mean, uh, if if you want my if you want to compare uh, Duncan's Duncan's opinions and my initial opinions, please go to our our Legion of Myth YouTube page. Uh, look up uh, Le Legion of Myth Star Trek Adventures. You will find my my three part uh, three thirty minute uh, expose about it. How I made a character, it's the the game system, the introduction, all that stuff. And while you're there, like and subscribe. Why not? It's good stuff. And uh, and uh, we will uh, we will see you next time. Uh, say, say goodbye to the YouTube folk. Bye, YouTube folk. All right.